everyone, my name is Chelsea. I'm here in the UK and I am joined, of course, by the very wonderful Dr. Robin. And that was my son you could hear singing in the background. Today, we are going to share with you some three awesome tips to help you get breastfeeding off to the best possible start. Robin, how are you? You've had a very, very busy day today. You haven't had a break for a few hours, so I've heard. No, I don't think I'll be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> Very go rounding. <laughs> yes, you don't stop. You're a very dedicated lady. So I'm very excited for today's show because we're also going to be sharing Dr. Robin's article on the APGAR score. So if you'd like to read that, pop the word APGAR down below and we'll make sure to send you the link to that as well. So Robin, I'd like to dive straight in with education during, pre during pregnancy. <laughs> Education preparation during pregnancy is, is our first top tip today. Why is it so important? Well, I feel like that's, there's a lot of that missing now where women are not well informed. And, and, and hence my presentation that I've de, uh, produced on the isation syndrome, because most women now are heading into an institution to have their baby. Fewer women are having their babies at home in the in the peace of their own home, and and of course my my experience has been across the board hospitals for years and in charge of a labour ward and across and then twenty five years home birthing, and I'm not suggesting everybody has to have home birth at all, but there's been a huge shift to institutionalisation, and I think that has um, affected what we once would do in in concentrating with people, uh, with couples, people, friends uh, in pregnancy. So I, th I think that's lacking. And I think also that the, the more informed that the, that the wonderful woman becomes and her advocate and her partner becomes during pregnancy, the stronger they are with their own knowledge and their own instincts. Because maternal instinct instincts outshine anything else a mother is instinctive for her mammal baby human mammal baby like any other mammal on the planet and they are very instinctive for their babies and we are the same our babies are highly alert with smell taste touch and knowing exactly where their mother is and what's happening and if we deprive the babies of that then we create stress for the baby and for the mother so if we're providing information sharing and we're increasing knowledge about the sort of things that may happen the sort of things that we can prevent the sort of things that are challenging then we can challenge the things that we're not happy about and we can be polite but we can actually you know it's our baby it's it's the mother's baby woman having the baby it's her baby it's her family that's important it's not us in the system we are there to provide a service if it's required but we do not have to interfere unnecessarily every woman has strengths and if we can encourage those strengths with within herself is is amazing and just a simple example is that i had a mother who came to see me once she'd been decide she decided that she wouldn't have her baby in the hospital and somebody said go, go and talk with me robin so this is years ago not not recently years ago and she was told that she'll never have her baby the way she wants to because she's too fat wow she had That's too rude. much weight on and they interpreted that because she had overalls on. You know, she had high pants coming over her baby in the tummy yeah. and she had little buckles here that pulled them up. Down to long wear, I think. Everyone will agree. Yeah. Well, she was out of, out of range. Anyway, <coughs> she had the most precious home birth. She decided. It just, it just goes to show how um, how quickly they do judge a situation without mm. without actually knowing any unique history, mm. which is something that you feel quite strongly about when you are guiding. Yeah, and that's only one example, but it's just to show that we can make women feel utterly terrible if we don't nurture them and look at what their skills are now and then help them improve in with information sharing, and then they start to connect their own knowledge and their own instincts start to, to rise. And then they're stronger when they have that information for themselves and they feel able to 
use it and do what they need to do. Absolutely. Well, I can I can yeah. certainly agree with you there from personal experience, and I'm sure mm -hmm. many women can agree as well. So, so Robin, Dr. Robin, I wanted to ask you why, what the relevance of education about breastfeeding in particular, and um, why that is so important during pregnancy. Why can't we leave it to chance? It's natural, right? Why can't we wait until baby's here to see? How um, it yeah, some people can leave it to chance, but if it's a first baby, it's a real steep learning curve because what we have done over the years is we've segmented or divided pregnancy, labour, birth, breastfeeding and early parenting. And and ideally there we don't we shouldn't be doing that. This is a mother growing her baby. Her baby's growing and transitioning. She's transitioning with her baby through pregnancy. She's learning to know the feel of her baby externally and internally if the midwife's spending enough time helping her feel where her baby is lying as while well, she's feeling it internally. And, and it's very gentle. It's not hard, moving, shoving, pushing. And then the partner can listen to the baby's heart rate. And, you know, and it's all very exciting. The little ones want to use the trumpet to listen to the, the heart rate. Yeah. And they're all involved. So it's a, it's a family affair. So when they're learning these, these things in pregnancy, they are much more in tune with themselves and their body and what's happening. So the next transition, nothing is segmented. The next transition is for that unique mother and her unique baby, her unique gestation. Gestation is not medicalised. Gestation is the mother's gestation according to her genetic history for this baby, this particular baby. All babies may be slightly different genetics. It might be different gestation too. Some might have a family history of a 43-week gestation whom I've worked with. And, you know, that's all terror now, but it's the family history and it's been fine. So we don't con we don't contemplate coercing her with fear at that stage. That's so then she transitions from pregnancy into early labour, maybe pre-labour. If it's her first baby, she'll be having some odd contractions, not odd contractions, she'll be having some intermittent contractions and then they might stop. And she might have, and it's like the baby's now starting to efface, thin out the cervix, and that takes a little bit of time. Then there's early labour when she now starts to feel the contractions starting to, hmm, you know, oh yeah, I can feel that. And in, in my experience over many years, it's usually around sundown when they start to come yeah, in. Yeah, and you can certainly labor. feel those. <laughs> yeah, and the sun's going down over the horizon, and once it disappears, that mother's safe to do what she needs to do. Many, many times have I seen that. Um, and then she becomes into she comes into established labour, and that's the real hard work starting then because the contractions are, are, are becoming more regular. They're becoming closer together. They're becoming stronger and longer. So there's a real energy going on inside her body with her baby negotiating its way with its little head preferably but if it's bottom that's okay too by me and <laughs> that's how you were born is it not yeah, yeah that's right yeah <laughs> so my mum did a mighty job first baby breech and uh, feet up sucking my toes and you know i have the best hamstrings now <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. So then, of course, we transition into breastfeeding, and yes. So the and next day is a natural is a natural progression. Yes, it's a transition from the mother. Oh, she's got her baby now, sensing her baby, and that all that beautiful connection from the inside now is here in her arms, and she's been waiting for that. And she might be fed up with it because it's been, you know, yeah. forty two weeks or whatever, and yeah. you know. But then now the women are happy just don't touch me, I'm happy to go for 42 weeks mm -hmm, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. The range generally is about 38 to 42 weeks because they put mathematics on it. Again, we've seen little babies between 38 weeks and earlier doing very well. So, you know, there's no... I guess real... the um, the due date is just an estimation anyway. Estimated so we, we never because... really know um, no. unless the dates are absolutely certain what, what yes. gestation you're at anyway. Yeah. That's so right. would you agree then, Dr. Robin, that the main reason we have to understand that it's a, a joined progression, a transition, as you called it, is so that we can we can make informed decisions 
during pregnancy, labour, birth and breastfeeding during those yeah. first that first breastfeed. And of course, to avoid those common painful complications and then to know what to do if a situation arises, which we yes. hadn't planned for. Yes. And to feel confident about making decisions as you go unless it's an absolute emergency so if it's an emergency the senior obstetrician not the junior doctors the senior obstetrician makes decisions for you mm -hmm. but when there's no absolute emergency there's time to talk about things there's time for you to decide what you would like to do and it should always be inclusive of you and your advocate someone who you have chosen to be with you to, to respond if necessary for you, who's been clearly working with you during the pregnancy, mm. understanding where it is you would like to be. Yeah. And you know, there's no rules in this game. It's not as if it's rules to do that. It's preparation to feel confident and to, to be able to say what you want to say without feeling scared about it or coerced yeah. about it. I think the confidence that you speak of is actually, it's really key. And I can relate personally to my experience and how I lacked that confidence. Mm -hmm. Everything was new to me, um, although I thought I was prepared, having gone to the local local services and local antenatal and breastfeeding classes. Um, mm -hmm. the, the resources and information provided sort of left me feeling less confident, which mm -hmm. which is not really what you intend to do when you when you do go to these things. But mm -hmm. confidence was a huge thing for me because I was second guessing myself. And then, of mm. course, I was having so much conflicting advice from everyone I saw, professionals, friends, family, and it just gets so overwhelming. And like you said, mm. you're vulnerable during those first hours and weeks. So having that strong advocate is so important. And of course, if you have the preparation, the education, the knowledge, the confidence behind you, it does make a world of difference. We've actually got a comment here, Rob, from um, Wendy, who I spoke to recently. She's a twin mum who went through the programme Hi, Wendy. I hope you're well. It's so, so lovely to hear from you. Um, she said, I'm so thank you, thankful I got the education during pregnancy with my twins um, and not afterwards. I don't think I would have made it to six months of breastfeeding, which she's currently at, by the way, Dr. Robin, um, mm. without them and the confidence I received in the education. So that is that's such a wonderful mm. testament from <laughs> hello, lovely. She said, hi, lovelies. So true, isn't oh, thank it? you. We do have a responsibility, people like me, to make sure that we nurture the mother because if we create stress for her, she that creates stress for her baby. And, you know, we talk about, you know, postnatal depression, mental illness. I think a lot of the time we do help create that. I think it's not always, but some of the time we are involved in creating fear and it, our whole role is to reduce fear not to create fear, not to coerce, to sit down and use language that's that's understandable for yourself and for your family and that's quiet and it's calm and also not to make decisions to give you suggestions so you can then make your own decisions. And those decisions can be as flexible as you want them to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're not rigid in any way. There's no mathematics, there's no rules. It's all about the suggestions. Now, if someone has, for example, gestational diabetes, my first thing is, is your gestational diabetes controlled? And yes, my diet controls. Well, then that's fine. You know, there should be really no pressure on you to do what you need to do in the time that you need to do it. And of course, if you have concerns and you're, you're talking about your concerns, then we need to listen. We don't need to tell you what to do. We need to listen and then work out with you which is the preferable way to go at this point in time. It's mm. not, you know, like sometimes we find the systemization just takes over a woman's life and the aim is to put you in, through and out of the system as fast as as possible that's so very very true and wendy mm -hmm. thank you so much for sharing your experience i'm sure you can yes, agree yeah. and relate to everything dr robin thank has you. just said thank you so i would like to then suggest our second point which i think fits quite nicely with everything you just made in that last point is the three golden hours so the top tip number two is to prepare for those three golden hours so we've got our education hopefully we've we're feeling confident and we're feeling prepared um, now we're going to prepare for those three golden hours. Dr. Robin, why is that precious time so important for a mother and her baby? Well, because it's that union of the mother and the baby, that, that the mother that chooses to breastfeed. I never, ever 
turn anybody away who chooses not to breastfeed or who can't breastfeed. There are women who are unable to breastfeed, but we work together too in the way that's necessary for them. But for the mother that, that needs to breastfeed, but I think that's important to know that in pregnancy, all of that's, you understand that that's a transition all the way through. So if you feel comfortable with what you're doing through there, then it makes it easier when your baby's in your arms. And understanding then, I think I'm on the right track, with is that when the baby's born, they will take time, depending on the circumstances, to work their way to your breast. Now, in my experience, it's been between half an hour and an hour to make their way to the breast. When the mother's holding the baby, it's covered with a little warm wrap. It's not rubbed. It's not taken from her at all. It's with her the whole time. And so then the baby and her work it out together and they're instinctively in tune with each other. The babies just come from inside her uterus. They are instinctive with each other. And so they work that together until the baby comes to the breast and the baby can locate the nipple with the tongue. The little tongue, similar tissue to the sensitive tissue, erectile tissue of the nipple, can locate the nipple. And, and when the baby can do that, then the baby's actually, the mammal baby's doing all it needs to do to survive. And then my role is to help you prevent having nipple trauma or nipple pain. So the three golden hours means the baby brings down the colostrum. We don't know whether it brings down all the colostrum. We don't know how much it brings down, but we know the colostrum is in the ductal networks ready for your baby to receive. At and birth. I think that also is, is, a, is a lovely way to refer back to what we were saying before about preparation and education, because we then have the confidence, because we have the understanding on how our body works to produce mm. that precious liquid gold, and we can have that mm. understanding which leads to then confidence to just trust mm. our body and our baby to know what they're doing. And first baby and other babies too, it, it, it is the hardest work a woman will do in her life. She's amazing with her strengths and what she can do. And yes, yeah, she can yell as loud as she likes. We don't mind. I don't mind. Other people might say, <laughs> shh, and I say, no, don't say that. She's working. She's working hard. She's using all the energy she has. She's waited, what, nigh on 40 weeks for this. She's doing the work. So our role is to nurture you through that time, quietly, gently, working in a way that's right for you so that transition to your breasts is easier for you and your baby in most circumstances. My gosh, absolutely. And and mm. for that to, to happen, for the, that precious first breastfeed to happen, you often talk about avoiding um, unnecessary interventions in those first three golden hours. So give us an example of things that we can avoid if we choose to. Okay, so the, the systemization has become and policyization. Policies mm. are not legal. Policies are designed for the hospital to do things that they want to do with you when they want to do it. So policies you can confidently say no to. But the 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 isation syndrome is, is become dramatic and large and so it means that you are taking your time that's required with your baby without pressure the midwives are observing they'll be observing your quietly observing your blood loss talking with that talking you with that because we don't want things to happen that we're not taking any notice of we don't want to go away for too long and leave you on your own we want to stay with you and your baby and we're looking at the babies how the baby's moving through these early hours too so then the baby what was the question so i was talking about some uh, 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 avoiding <laughs> some unnecessary interventions sorry i got caught up oh, on avoiding as well. <laughs> yeah, so, so give us an really example important. of something we can avoid um you often say um not needing to clean the baby for example no no, it's not, and it's not. It's not necessary to inject the baby. It's not necessary to weigh the baby. It's not necessary for anybody to touch the baby when the APGAR score is seven or above. Yeah, that and that, that's, that's a good time for us to drop in. If anyone wants to learn more about the APGAR score, which is a super important thing to know, and it's actually yes. very shocking that women aren't regularly taught about it. They really. should, and they should be able to do their own APGAR score and their partner, and then they communicate with that too, or their advocate. It, they shouldn't understand all of that. And then that means that we can't take over 
in a situation that's unnecessary. And, and, uh, and so, you know, the APGAR score has helped us for many years now. Uh, and the other thing is not to cut the cord. Mm. You know, not to cut the cord till the cord is thinned and there's no more blood flow. It's gone white and thinned right down. That's hard for some people. Uh, and uh, the baby in the meantime can be breastfeeding. If it's not a short cord, if it's a short cord, we have to try and manoeuvre things a little bit, but that's okay too. We just work it out on the unique situation mm -hmm. with every mother and every baby. Um, very again, important. That's why yeah. education is so important because it's yeah. about the woman's unique choice and being able to respect that choice. Yeah. And if she has the knowledge and understanding, she can make an informed decision for herself and hopefully the team around her will support her through that. And so one very, of the last final can I want to just say one more thing, please? Go on. <laughs> Sorry. It's very important that your baby smells you and touches you. And even if your baby did need to be taken, something that you've had goes with your baby. So that smell is not disconnected from you because the hospital smells and the smells of everybody else is totally different to your mammal baby and your smell. Oh, it brings back so many memories when you talk yeah. about that. It's so true. Skin to skin is another yeah. important important thing yeah. to consider with the three golden hours. So one last thing I wanted to just really lightly touch upon um, about those three golden hours is that actually some of us may not be able to experience those three golden hours. Our babies may not have an APGAR score of seven. But that's totally okay, isn't it, Dr. Robin? It's yes. totally okay to have to have that change and, and to then come back to breastfeeding a little bit later. Yes, and it's it's preferable if the mother's okay for her to be close to her baby, regardless if the baby's APGAR score is seven and the baby's going to the nursery, either you or your your partner or your advocate is close to the baby as well. And that something of yours goes that sm smells to your baby as well. The more the baby has its olfactory nerve smelling you, then the, the reassurance is higher, not smelling everybody else. And of course, all the things that are used in hospitals smell too. So. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, and a yeah. big shout out to any um, nurses, midwives, doctors that are working in the NICU units, you, you and all midwives do such wonderful work. So, so thank yes. you and for everything you do. Yes, and just so that you, uh, you know, that you don't feel like you're being disconnected unnecessarily from your baby. That the, if the baby does need help, of course, nobody's going to do that. But the complementary services that we provide for with you between professionals is so important that we mm, connect mm. with you and we include you all the time. We don't leave long hours go by if you're worrying. We check on you to make sure you're okay when your baby's not with you. We keep you informed of what the baby is actually doing at this point in time. Uh, and if possible, we bring you to the baby. Yes. Yeah. If only that would be great, wouldn't it? So, yeah. of course, one last point that we should mention, which is so important about those three golden hours, um, is avoiding forceful techniques, handling of baby and your breasts. Yes. Well, that's my research, as you know, and that was the prime reason for um, uh, forceful breastfeeding was the forceful techniques, forcing a baby to the breast, which the, was, was the teaching of the time over about a 40, 50 year period. And it still and, is yeah. from my understanding, the most common yes. practice. Oh, it's still common, cradle. yes. And grabbing a mother's breast without her consent, touching her body without her consent, and then taking her baby by the base of the skull where the small brain is, the small brain sits in there. And that's the little brain that coordinates all the movement that the baby moves makes mm. so and and we have because as dr robin said her research her entire extensive phd research is based on this there is a wealth of information and resources available to you guys so let us know if you'd like to know more about that yeah. and very as we really important before, about unexpected circumstances if you'd like to be fully prepared for breastfeeding and know what to do in an unexpected situation and be able to still um, prepare and, and enjoy breastfeeding when that time is come, that when that time comes, then let us know because in the online education, there is just so much to help you be fully prepared for that as well. C-section, induction, anything that you are concerned about, let us know. So yes. the final point then, Robin, which I suppose is not necessarily the number three tip, but they're all equally as important, um, is the birth plan. We can include 
all of those things in our birth plan and it's important um, to, to express our wishes, right? Yes, absolutely, because this is your baby, this is your body. And, and you know, of course, things deviate and when they do deviate, we go with that deviation and the experienced people, midwives, doctors will help you through that time. Uh, and they'll nurture you, I hope. They won't be, you know, creating a lot of fear for you. But, yes, the birth uh, the birth plan is a way of you. It's an intermediary communication with the people that are going to be providing service for you, caring for you. And so if you have to, uh, you know, think about what it is you would like or if you would like to think about what you'd like, <laughs> then you can pop it into a written plan. And that doesn't mean to say that plan is going to be rigid. It just means that other people are having an idea of the direction that you are choosing to head in and they're aiming to help you do that. And a lot of midwives will do that. They'll actually help you achieve your 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 journey um, by being beside you rather than being over you. You know, they'll yeah, be with you quietly. They'll be sitting with you. And hopefully, uh, whoever you're choosing as your primary carer, to, to sit with you, not behind a desk, but to sit beside you and work through your your plan with you and talk about the things that are in it and without frightening you. So they can talk about the benefits, they can talk about the risks, but they're not actually aiming to have consent from you yet. They're just understanding where you would like to be, but responsibly also they're saying, well, you know, maybe, but we don't want to do it in a maybe way mm. that frightens you. Yeah, That's the worst we can do because that just sets your... Which is also quite common. And, and as I mentioned earlier about the antenatal classes that I attended, my question was surrounding pain relief. And the midwife that was hosting, let's call it hosting the session, um, she said, oh, there's no medal for women that don't have pain relief. Just use it. And there was no, there was no then extended conversation on what the risks no. are and the benefits and then mm. the actual um, the effects that, that some, um, some of the, these pain reliefs can have on mother and the breastfeeding baby as well, which you also talk about in, in depth in the online. And education. what are the alternatives? They can yes, explain of the course, alternatives right, to you. Yeah. And they can also explain what your rights are as well. And, you know, we all know that we're not playing a game against anybody. We're, we're actually working towards a woman having her baby, giving birth to her, growing her baby, giving birth to her baby in the way she is choosing to do mm -hmm. it. And, and it's it's really important. We do know by all of the research that's coming out now that the the intervention rate has increased the cesarean section rate mm -hmm. and it's sort of very much out of proportion now. Mm -hmm. And, of mm -hmm. course, breastfeeding rates aren't increasing, so that's something we should be questioning. Well, that affects well. breastfeeding rates because the drugs involved make the baby sleepy and we, mm -hmm. we in, my, in my team, see sleepy babies all of the time and we are mm -hmm. sitting through feeds with mothers every single day m more than once a day we're sitting through feeds with women and these little babies are affected by the opioids and then when the mother has endone or something like that afterwards a poor little baby's coordination is affected and you know even though we say it doesn't worry them it does it certainly does. Of course. No and of course, there is a place and a necessity yeah. for interventions as well. Um, yeah. But of course, it's necessary to understand why and to be able to make informed decisions again. So yeah. I think what's really important in all of this decision making for, for creating your, your own unique birth plan is to understand the hospital policy so that we can see what our rights are, like you just said, Dr. Robin. Mm. That's right. And um it's all it's all about you this is your time your baby this is about you it's not about the system it's not about the doctors it's not about the the midwives it's not about the lactation consultants it's not about the politicians for sure <laughs> <laughs> and hospital policy is not yeah. law yeah and it's not law so it's all about you and this is prime time in a woman's life and, and and if we respect that the outcomes for her are much much better she's in control she might have to do something that she doesn't plan to do but that's also easier for her to work through when the other side comes out when she knows you know that that's that's uh you know again we don't um we don't i don't have any firm decisions at all and working in the moment with women all the time 
and their babies, they are unique. Every mother on the planet is unique. Every baby on the planet is unique. Every next generation is unique. <laughs> yes, so all true. About I love how you always talk about that and how you talk about breasts and nipples and breast size yeah. and everything. You're always unique. so very unique. No two people the same. That's very true. And it's a good thing to consider as well when you're making these decisions because you may differ from what most people are, are planning yeah. in their pregnancy, birth, labour. And um, actually breastfeeding, although you're, you've now spent time considering your preferences, your birthing preferences, you've done your research on how you prefer to be, be birthing your baby. Now it's, it's your suggestion to also include a section in your birth plan on breastfeeding. And as we were speaking about those three golden hours, why is it important to include that in your birth plan if you choose to have one because the routine behavior is to take the baby to do all the things and often it's taking the baby somewhere else some places some midwives will bring the scales and if a mother really wants to know what her baby's weight is that's fine but generally you can do the apgar score and you can look at a baby skin turgy you can see the and that baby's fine to be with its mother but again it's taking the baby away to inject it and then you see the sometimes they're really rough other times they're very gentle mm -hmm. and so it just depends on and when your baby's taken you don't know what's happening with your baby you don't see what's happening with your baby and then you're worrying and then the stress levels are rising when we don't need that mm -hmm. right at this so point true. in time when you're transitioning with your little baby from your uterus to your arms we don't need any stress at all unless it's absolutely necessary mm. and then that's a different set of uh, planning that and we're, we're prepared for that if that does happen and even when uh, all my years of 25 years of home birthing we were planning if something did happen what we would do and mm. today I had the opportunity to respond because um, in Melbourne uh, that I, I something came up about there was banning home birth because there's no ambulance service available. So I never ever went by an ambulance with a woman in, and, and the transfer rate was very low. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I, that I, there's, there's a, a bit of research in the UK going on now, actually. Um, anyone watching, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe that they've proven that the actual um, admission rates and the use of cost of everything um, inside the hospital system is so dramatically lower for those in communities which are using the home birth services and some women are actually choosing to free birth without any medical assistance now because their rights and their choices are just being stripped from them which is which is surely a little bit more dangerous than having a home birth team with you at your home well the risks are there's no one there to help you if you if something does happen but you can always uh transport in you know, but the trouble is often you don't realise until it's well underway. So whereas for me, I'm looking and, and, and thinking ahead and being prepared. So if I'm prepared, and I'm sure that's why I never used to have, to, never called an ambulance because, you know, if I think there's something that's worthy of transferring, I'm talking with the, the, the family and saying that it would be probably preferable to do this now rather than later. And then we can go quietly together and, um, and I talk to the team that I'm coming to and they welcome me with open arms and, you know, and but that sort of thing has changed. There's mm. too much control. There's too much, um, too much uh, not focusing on the woman herself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. So there we have it. Those are the three top tips. Top tips, that's a tough one to say. And I almost said something else as well. <laughs> Those are the three top tips for today's session. We hope you found them helpful. And if you would like to expand on the knowledge you've gained from today's session and learn more about all of those things that we've just covered, then do let us know. Um, I'd love to connect with you and let you know more about Dr. Robin's online education. There is a wealth of resources available. There's also um, lifetime support in our wonderful breastfeeding club as well. So do pop the comment yes down below if you'd like to learn more. And of course, don't forget, if you'd like to learn more about the APGAR score, let us know down below as well. And just before we go, I'd just like to say hello to everyone watching. We've got a lovely yes. lot of comments that have come in from Lynn. Hello, Lynn. When I Renelza. gave birth, my <laughs> oh, bless her. Taylor, Candice. Yes. Renelza again. <laughs> Women sharing their experiences. Hello. And 
Lynn just said, loving this, connecting all the dots for me and how I always want to support women. And we do have the very, very lovely Renelza who is watching as well. Um, and, and she has said that because she's going through the Academy, Dr. Robin, the Thompson Method oh, Breastfeeding Academy. Um, Sorry, she is a new right. member on our team. <laughs> yes, very exciting, <laughs> wonderful yeah. work. Um, and she said that she cannot wait to educate women on those three golden hours. Um, an uninterrupted mother and bub time, she said. And that's very true, isn't it? Very true. Yeah, it is, yeah. So there it's we have beautiful it. beautiful to be beside a woman who's got her new baby and not interfere. It's absolutely beautiful to watch the connection and the movements and, and everything that's going on. And if we just take that time, yeah. oh, it makes such a difference. Yes, <laughs> and I hope that I am privileged enough to be able to experience it in that way next time. Um, I should imagine it'll be a stark difference <laughs> to my first experience with Jacob. Yeah. So, Dr. Robin, again, thank you so much for your time. We cannot even imagine how busy you've been today. You've been on so many calls, um, yeah. the Academy, going live as well. So thank you so much for your time. And if there's anything else you wanted to add before we go? Well, today I had another, all week we've, all week we've had, and last week, beautiful women who've come on to on, on live with their new babies. And, you know, they're only within a week old, roughly, sometimes two. And they'd done a breastfeed with me so that the academy team could see and uh, whichever group they belong to in the academy and that they could see fine tuning and they could see women saying that the pain was reduced or the pain was gone. How so amazing is that? I'm thinking, thank goodness, because you know, it's just, it's not hard, but it takes time, it takes patience mm -hmm. and it takes understanding that unique mother her unique body, her unique breast, nipples, her unique baby, everything about her and her baby's connection with her is unique. And, you know, we can modify things to meet her needs for her sure uniqueness too. too. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, yeah. there you go. There you have it. I, I'm sure that um, anyone watching the session has, has left the session feeling a lot more informed. Do get in touch, guys. We love hearing from you. And if you are pregnant and watching, Congratulations from us both. Dr. Robin, thank you so much again. And guys, you, we will see you here the next same time next week. And we'll be sharing a wonderful story with one of our very, very special members. Bye, okay, guys. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Bye-bye.